showing you some things on the screen. I do not have printouts. So what you're going to get is on that screen. So make sure you're close enough to be able to read it. Um, and I think there's some new faces in here. So if you want the quick intro to me, um, my name is Catherine Ham. You can call me Catherine, Ham, or Cat, or any nickname related to Ham. Um, and I've been in real estate for 15 years. I guess January will be 16. So 15 and a half, I don't know. And I built my business based off of referral. I have always worked mainly, or sorry, yeah, I built my business mostly off of buyers and I worked off of referral. There are a couple of times I dabbled with a couple of getting leads from this or that and, and um, uh, well, short sales when that was a big thing. I started to specialize in that just because I wanted to take care of my people. Um, expired for sale by owners still a little bit of it but really my bread and butter has always been working by referral i at a certain point my biggest year i did 70 something units as a team of like three and a half or four or five i don't know uh and i didn't grow fast enough so i started to backslide after that i couldn't keep up that momentum i broke my systems and me um and and i would hire someone and then they moved to dc and then i hired someone and they moved back to california and i hired someone and they moved to dc so it was like i i uh, wasn't back feeling fast enough um so i've been at my biggest a team of five and a half i was back to a team of two i folded my team and i joined the pace of richmond so yeah. so that's my history over the last 15 16 years um, at my biggest, I was 75% buyers. I was super buyer heavy. Um, on one hand, in the buyer's market, that meant I was closing, you know, a lot um, of, of my business. Whereas if you had listings, you might not sell 50% of your stuff if your sellers couldn't afford to price it right, right? Um, so on one hand, it was great in the down market. On the other, uh, it takes a lot more time. So I wasn't leveraged. And it definitely um, kind of stunted my growth at a couple of points. Um, and then even as I was building my team, I didn't let go of it fast enough because uh, I was so good at it. It was kind of scary. It's kind of scary to let go of the only thing I really do how to do well, right? Um, so here I am. Uh, so part of the systems I put together is I have been maxed out. So I knew I had to build a system that um, made the best use of my time and got buyers ready to write offers as quickly as possible. Um, so um, there's a lot more that you can get away with if you're only working with a couple of people at a time. Uh, once you start to max out your business, then then every everything that you're doing becomes a lot more crucial. Um, and can make or break an experience for a buyer too. So any any questions about me or business or why I'm even here? Teaching them that? Um, all right, so buyer consultation. This happens in order. So I have what I call buyer intake or needs analysis. Uh, I'm pretty sure Ignite goes over certain elements of that. So, or, or lead intake, right? So if you're converting an internet uh, lead or someone refers someone to you and you're doing that initial introductory call, that is where you're going. You're trying to capture as much of their contact information as possible. And then you're going into the timeline, uh, those types of questions, uh, and uh, and then eventually getting into the needs analysis about what their perfect you know, home is and going into all those details. That is all happening prior to the buyer consultation. 
Um, so for me, buyer consultation is when um, either I'm using the buyer consultation to continue to close a buyer to choose me, sign, sign me as their buyer agent, or I'm, um, or they've already chosen us as the buyer's agent, uh, and we might we might not do the buyer consultation right away if they're six months to 12 months out. A lot of times people will reach out because they want to start the planning. We're connecting them to the lender. We're helping them get their ducks in a row. They're going to start driving by, but they don't want to do anything till spring. Well, then what I might say is when we look at their timeline, if I say, okay, it makes sense to start looking at property in February, then I'm going to make note for myself that I want to call them in January and schedule that buyer consult. So that we're doing it a little bit closer to um, to when they're going to be looking, uh, and so you can use the buyer consult to help really seal the deal and have someone go, oh wow, this person does great value, I want to sign with them, or you do it closer to the actual buying process. Uh, however, 99% of the time, I want them to have gone through this buyer consultation before I schedule any showings. And, or step for it and you're home with them. Uh, there, there's some caveats to that, but not many. Uh, any questions about that? Just do a bunch of terms about it. Okay. Um, so let's talk about why this is this is the is this working? Uh, this is the you guys get to participate part. Um, so why why do we do a buyer consult at all? Why are we doing a buyer consult? Throw out, yell out your answers. Set expectations for both sides. Great. What else? Go over there once and needs. That would be needs analysis. Oh, but that that is great. I I put that into a different category. Educate them on the mark. Sorry. Educate them on the mark. Decide if you want to work with them. Yeah. Get the bio rep agreement. Explain <laughs> the process. Talk to me a little more about um, set expectations. What expectations are we setting in the buyer consult? Get Drill down on that for me. What's not going to happen and what will happen? Because some people have a misunderstanding of what a seller's market is. They can get a market. Each party's responsibilities and realistic timelines are the work balance. <laughs> <laughs> Our responsibilities. What was the second part of that? It was really good. Um, realistic timelines. Got it. I think someone said education, but you really want to make sure the client understands the, the home buying process, especially first time home buyers. I love it. Okay. Um, I think some specifics I might add are. Um, so to drill a little further about setting expectations, to get a little more specific about that and explain the process, you're going to see that during the buyer consultation, I'm going through the entire 10 page contract. So when a buyer is done with the buyer consult and you're going to look at homes, I want to specifically set the expectation that they may fall in love with their first house and they need to be ready to write an offer. Um, so the so to me one of the big expectations of the buyer consult is that they are ready to write an offer when you're done with this meeting. Um, all these are great answers though, and all goes into it. So bravo! I'm glad I don't have to convince you guys that it's a good thing to do. <laughs> um, some other questions I'm going to out there. Uh, for people who were having right now, they're like, oh, sorry. 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 Oh,
for people who were in the market this crazy spring, how many offers were you writing per buyer? Four. Four. It was taking four to get them under contract. Six. Six. Anyone else have numbers? How many offers were you writing? Two to three. Two to three usually. That's good. Anyone more? I heard horror stories of like 23. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. See, these agents are always the best. These yeah, numbers are so much better in this room. Um, awesome. So, yeah, that's one more reason to do the buyer consult is I was sharing these stories out there in the field and clear the, clearly the buyer's agents weren't prepared and their buyers were not prepared. And so they were learning on the go instead of being prepared from, from, you know, out of the gate. And some of our buyers, it is going to take them one or two before they're willing to waive, you know, the things that they need to waive. Uh, they, they have to, test, you know, there's, there's a little bit of testing that has to happen. Sometimes they have to lose to feel the pain to then be motivated to do the right things. And that's fine. So that's where two to three is, um, I think is very reasonable. If you're consistently taking six, seven, eight, 10 more, then that is where, uh, there's usually an opportunity to either go back and retrain your buyers to start from the beginning uh, and or there may be some training and scripting that you might need to take to the next level. Um, so it's good, it's good to look at from both, both angles. Um, how, so for people who are doing buyer consult, consultations already, how long do you spend doing your buyer consultation? Now I'm saying that again, like I, in my head, the needs analysis is its own conversation. That's when I'm doing like the lead intake and gathering the initial information about what they want in a home. Their, you know, what makes it is their must haves and, and deal breakers. To me, that could be a 10 minute, it could be a 45 minute conversation, depending if I'm talking to a high D or a high C. Um, so the buyer console is, is for me, I've broken that out to when I'm reviewing all the contract documents. The, the process, everything that happens between now and closing. So how long do you guys spend talking about that with your clients? And it's okay if you say, not at all. You just run out and start showing comps. That's pretty normal. Yeah. Okay. That's the meeting that you're doing? Awesome, okay. If it's someone that's done this before, 45 minutes okay. or so. If it's a okay. brand new, I've only rented, never even made it out. It takes like that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I think it can be anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour, depending on, like you said, if they've been through the process before, if they know the region. Yeah. But but then, you know, there's a lot of layering and repeat yes. as you go along. Yeah. So it's hours <laughs> at the end. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. It's something where um, in the field, um, like agents from other companies. So the answers here are at the next level because this, this is Kevin Williams. And so you guys are getting trained to that next level. But I'll tell you as a listing agent, um, the conversations we have with buyer agent and the feedback that we get, um, we can tell they have not had those conversations with their buyers by the things they say to us, right? And so there's so many buyers agents out there who are um, who are skipping this step completely. And there's so, uh, I think there's so many companies and teams that just push like the internet leads and everything. So it's just set an appointment, go show a house, and they know nothing about the people that they're meeting. Uh, so even when I was doing internet leads, I would qualify them. And I was never running out to a house to meet a stranger that I didn't have some information from, right? Safety, um, also my time. Um, so uh, a couple, Okay, uh, so for me, the needs, the need, the lead intake needs analysis combination, which will be another class in a future date, if you guys do want to come back for that, there's a lot of scripting that I kind of blend in, into the, that conversation, that is anywhere between 20 minutes to, you know, 45 minutes, maybe an hour. Uh, the buyer consult for me is usually an hour. Uh, it can sometimes take longer, again, with those high detail people, someone who wants to ask a lot of questions. When I used to do the two together, it would take at least 90 minutes. With my engineers, I was sometimes in a conference room with them for two to three hours. Uh, so that is where I started to split it up um, for my own sanity, but also it's, I'm not wearing the buyer out as much, and they, in their minds, it's two different conversations, so they're able to digest more uh, by, by breaking it up. 
And after the needs analysis, you can move forward with the MLS, you know, getting the MLS portal and all of those things done. Um, they may even be ready to already sign a buyer agency agreement. So then I can kind of play around with when do I want to do the buyer console? If they're already the they're working with me, then we can push it closer to when we're actually looking at homes. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. You ready for me to jump in? So the first thing I'm going to share with you is my organization. Can you see that? All right. So this in my in my online files in my drive, I have a file folder called buyer consult docs. So when I have a buyer consultation scheduled and I'm emailing them the confirmation or I'm emailing them the, the day before the morning of to send them these documents. I don't really care if they review them ahead of time. I just want them to have it because it's my backup. If my Google Meet thing crashes or we're having bad connection, they can pull up these docs on their laptop and I can talk them through it over the phone, right? And we can just turn it to a conference call. So I always like a backup to a, to a virtual presentation. Um, also, there are a couple of documents here that I want to be in their possession. So at a later date, I can all, you know, it's, it's one of those CYA things um, where all of these things have been disclosed to them well up front. So, uh, and I've numbered them one, two, three, four, because that's the order that I'm, show, I'm talking to them in the, uh, in our presentation. So it helps me to click on the right thing, but also helps them if they're opening things uh, in their own email. So. Is there anyone who can't read this? I don't know how big it should I back there. Do you want me to quickly run through it? It's okay. Why don't you just read yeah, the title? Okay. Um, so the first one that way is the full 10-page purchase agreement. The second is the resident, residential property disclosure statement, the one-page statement. Then I have the summary of that, the lead-based paint disclosure, our buyer booklet. So that's the presentation material for the Pace of Richmond. Um, if you're in Ignite, you probably have your Keller Williams version that you may have started to work on customizing yourself. If you're with another team, I'm sure your team has one. So that's, that's what that, that booklet will be. Um, and the buyer brokerage agreement, which is from the, it's the net docs. Uh, and then um, the three, so we have three disclosures. One is for the PACE team, then McLean and Vesta are the two for the office. Am I missing one for the office? <laughs> Okay. I'm playing this. Okay. Um, so all of those are going to the buyer up front. And I'll kind of skip to the conclusion, which is when I'm sending that buyer broker shooting it over, I'm also getting all the disclosures signed. So I may be getting those signed months before they're buying a house. Uh, I don't want any of that in my way when I'm writing an offer and negotiating. And the listing agent, by the way, doesn't give any cares. About. Good job. Good job. That's a growth opportunity. <laughs> the listing agent doesn't care about all of our excessive paperwork. In fact, it annoys them. So if you want to be the best buyer agent possible, don't give the listing agent things that they don't need. So get all this stuff done ahead of time. Have that saved in your buyer folder as ratified. And then when you do get them under contract, you have what you need for the office paperwork. Does that sound good? Love it. So all that's going over uh, up front. So, uh, with with the pandemic, I switched, of course, um, these bar consultations to be virtual. I'm probably never going back. <laughs> virtual is absolutely the way to go. Uh, it makes it easier to schedule. There's more flexibility in the schedule. Um, it allows me uh, to be home uh, and not have to commute, not have to meet them here. It's, it's so much more, it's more comfortable for them. It's more comfortable for us and provides a lot more flexibility. Um, and I think... Uh, has, uh, it also can provide a little more focus. I think it's harder for someone to interrupt you in a virtual. <laughs> so it kind of forces them to save some of their questions till later. Because uh, once you flip to the presentation stuff, I can't see them anyway. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, there's a couple of comments there. All right. So the first thing I am reviewing with the buyer is the purchase agreement. Yeah. All right. So does anyone have question? Does anyone have a question so far about why I'm doing what I'm doing? So I'm thinking about 
the mass majority of my buyers are first time home buyers, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the quickest and easiest ways to loosen the process to overload them mm -hmm. too much at one time mm -hmm. that isn't actually relevant to where we are at the step. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to how this wouldn't be overload because we're not there yet. So what's the strategy of going over this stuff now versus in the moment? Mm -hmm. Or even what's the one step mm -hmm. before that? Yeah, no, that's awesome. So um, I do have to gauge that with with the different um, personalities. So so there's sometimes there's a caveat to that. However, I'll say probably 95% of the time my first time buyers eat all this up, okay. right? Okay. Uh, and I'll let them know if you're not you're not buying until next summer. That's totally fine. It's your first time. A lot of times first time buyers will say, I don't know what I don't know. I don't know yeah. what questions yeah. I'm supposed to ask. And so um, so that's where this is my chance to start. Uh, I'm doing a couple things. I'm educating them. I'm setting expectations as I'm going through the contracts, and I'm future pacing. Uh, and so, um, and I'm also letting them know they're going to be a, a much savvier buyer than most of the other buyers out there because they're they're getting this review, right? Um, so, so sometimes with my first time buyers, I may do it with them right now, like as soon as they raise their hand and say, "I'm thinking about this." Like, great, let's. Here, here are what the next steps look like. Does this sound good to you? Is this something that you want right now? Nine times out of 10, they say yes. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they'll be the ones to punt it. I say, I'm not quite ready for that yet. Just help me with the first step, right? Uh, if they're pretty far out, what I tell them is, okay, if you're not looking until July, then in May or June, we, want, we need to have this conversation again. And I will do another contract review with them. So it may go a little faster. There may be fewer questions. Uh, but again, it's if we can show them five properties, write one contract, and get them under contract, that's well worth that second hour, right? For sure. Great question. Um, okay, so I don't explain every single clause. I let them know that this con this contract has been emailed to them. If they're high detail people, they can read through the whole contract on their own. And they can always circle back to me with any questions that they have. One, the first law that I do want to point out, though, is the personal property included. So this is where the contract itself uh, outlines a bunch of items that automatically convey unless the seller had said otherwise. And so that list includes, you know, the blinds and blah, blah, carpeting, range of a dishwasher. Those are things the seller is not allowed to take out unless it's otherwise written in the contract. Then we want to add any item that the buyer wants to make sure will convey. So here's my little note as a reminder, right? Kind of spelling it out to them. Uh, that refrigerator, microwave, washer, dryer, bathroom mirrors, garage shelving, a mobile kitchen island, porch swings, smart home systems, doorbells. All of those things are considered personal property. So if a buyer wants to make sure that it conveys, it needs to get written into the contract. If they, um, if, and this is where I start to set expectations for different markets. If we're in a competing offer situation, then we're gonna check with the seller, what does the seller plan to leave behind? If they don't plan to leave it, we're not going to write anything here. We're not gonna ask for anything that you can easily go out and buy yourself because we don't wanna give the seller a reason to say no to a contract. Make sense? Yep. Um, I, I have found recently that other than the pre-printed items, mm -hmm. I have to just say see addendum and put it all on the addendum for the lenders will kick it back right. and say, I'm not gonna pay for the refrigerator. So I don't, I don't know if you're seeing that, but. Mm -hmm. 15 um, years, I, I, I've seen other agents do that because of an experience they've had, and in 15 years, I've never had a problem going, mm -hmm. going through. But I'm really, like, 90% 90, 90 of the time, yeah, my buyers are using the lenders I recommend. Yeah. So I don't know, you know, I don't know if the credit unions are here or whatever else, but um, so yeah, it's something you can put in, in, so in, in my mind, in my mind, in the cleanest way is to put it here because it's the first thing that everyone sees. Uh, and if a lender has a problem with it later, then we just we whip up an agenda. It's not a problem. Um, but I'm going to default to the way I prefer to do a contract and then let the lender be a problem later. That's an easy fix. Some things you can't fix. Once the lender sees something, they can't unsee it. Mm -hmm. So you're careful about those things. But not this one. Uh, all right. So um, 
I went ahead and checked on this box. Of course, it's not always included, but I checked um, other and wrote in escalation clause. Uh, RER did come up with its own escalation clause addendum. Uh, so you can also, you might also already have your own clauses that are provided um, from the broker or attorneys. Uh, but then we did, RER did come up with its own separate clauses. That's just a, a reminder to talk about in this current market, in the seller's market, if we're in a competing offer situation, it's become more and more common for us to include escalation clauses. What that means is you may give a base offer price and then you're going to tell the seller, hey, if you have multiple offers that drive this price up, you're willing to go up to X amount. So you, you do not want to lose a property within this range. And so it gives you some peace of mind as a buyer that you're not paying 30000 more than you needed to for a home uh, when the market was appreciating so quickly the last couple of years. The listing agent, most of the listing agents became a lot more relaxed as far as accepting escalation clauses, uh, and it helps the buyers feel like um, they're not just automatically getting screwed, you know, by being emotional with their offer. Yeah. Are there particular amounts over with the escalation clause that get better than others, like a thousand over, or two thousand over, like? Uh, absolutely. Um, and getting into specifics like that would probably be better for a contract writing class. Okay. Um, and, and yes, and, and that started changing as the market started doing that. So we used to do a thousand, then we started doing five or whatever, um, started doing much bigger. Um, because a thousand dollars over a cash offer doesn't matter, right? right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you, you sometimes had to do more money to make up for other terms. And that's where getting as much information from the agent helps. But right now, this is just about educating the buyer about what to expect but what they might have to do if we're competing. And so as I'm going through the contract, I'm explaining, hey, if there's no offers, we do this. If there's multiple offers, then we're gonna need, we wanna make some of these adjustments. Yeah. So I'm seeing some of the groups that I'm on for the, like Richard Realtor and KW. Well, some agents <laughs> are, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> well, sorry, just accepting sentence. Uh, a lot of agents are saying, they were, they're, they're asking not to include the escalation clause. Mm -hmm. What would be the downside as a seller's agent to tell somebody we don't want to see escalation? Awesome. Okay, this is also kind of like an outlier to this, but I love the question, so I'm going to answer it anyway. Um, thank you so much. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm so sorry. Thanks, Mary. No, thank you so much. Um, and, and the part, part of the reason I'll ask this, this does come up with, with some of the buyers too. So I think it is helpful. So as a listing agent, that was when I used to say no escalation clauses. Before the last two years, it's like no escalation clauses because they're complicated. Uh, or sometimes I might let them in in the first place and then I tell them remove it. And here's the offer we want to see from you. Um, so, oh, and as a buyer's agent, when I first got in the, in the business, so that was 2006 and the market crashed shortly thereafter. And so it was the, buyer's market for a bulk of that time. If you come in with an escalation clause, you're telling this, you're showing your cards. Mm -hmm. You're like playing poker and you're telling everyone what you got. And so um, the listing agent can then just turn around and be like, great, we want that number. Right. And I did that as a listing agent. I had an escalation clause come in. It's like, okay, we counter at that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it can it can backfire and be used against you. Now where things shifted in the last two years um, is that it was like, Everything was moving so fast and it was such big jumps um, that people, I think that people have become more relaxed about it. There's only one or two agents I've seen be really strict. Um, and part of that is because if you remove the escalation clauses, then the offers are coming lower. So I'm going to allow them now. I'm going to see everything that I've got. It all gets put into a spreadsheet. I'm comparing all of the terms. And then I'm strategizing with the seller. Do we want to go back and call highest and best from all of them? Or do we want to go back to our top two or three? Um, who, you know, who's worth still talking to? And then we're going to go back and be really specific. Like, um, here's what you're up against. You're up against a cap, you know, if you're up against a cash buyer, then you need to do this with your price. Otherwise, their terms are more attractive. Like, we're not going to go for you if you're within 5000 or right? And so that's where I can have really specific conversations with those um, with those agents. So that's why I'm okay with those escalation clauses coming in because it allows me to see what is the max they're willing to do. 25 oh. 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 Oh.
Um, uh, and one thing that I heard too about that was that a lot of agents, like she's savvy and she has done this a long time and can look at 25 escalation clauses and figure out highest and best and where it needs to land. A lot of agents who are doing the call to action, all offers due by Monday at nine o'clock, decisions made by 12. It could take them, yeah, it's too much. And when you've got, you know, upwards, some people are getting 30, 40 offers. And if they're all escalating to here, and if this, then that, it would take a month of Sundays to work it out. So that's why some agents were like, just bring me your highest and best. Let's not play the shell game. But a little lazy. Uh, <laughs> and also, once you have that first round of offers in for that second round, maybe remove your highest and best because at this point, you're um, the it's the other terms that make so like we might be willing to take something that's ten or fifteen lower that's cash if, if you're just a thousand dollars above, right? But if you put your highest number in, now it's worth the risk. Now the reward is worth the risk to go with yours. So that is why you may get feedback after offers have been submitted. Remove your highest and best, and you know here's what the seller is looking for. Um, so does that help from both? Like, yeah. there's pros and cons to it. There's good and bad. Um, and in different markets, we can, we can treat it differently too. Uh, and that's really good because we those are some of the conversations we do have to have with our buyers up front. Um, so that way they're not freaking out when they're writing that first offer. These are these are all good things for them. Them to know. Um, okay, so of course, this is where the purchase price is going in. And as you can see, there's a whole lot of information that I'm putting in that relate to your loan. This is why it's so imperative for you to talk to the lender before we do anything else. So we're not looking at homes until you finish that pre-approval because we can't write an offer without that information and your contingency is based off of this. So I don't want to get it wrong because that I can't protect you as well then. That it's makes sense. completely clear to me now why you do what you do. The process that makes so much sense. Oh, <laughs> every, every clause is my way to reset expectations, tell them what they're doing next, future pacing. All right, so um, with the appraisal clause, so this is top of page two. Uh, in most cases, we're going to check that box that says it is subject to the appraisal. You're going to see when I go on to additional terms on page six that there is a clause we can put in there where it's still subject to the appraisal, but we can still make you stronger by waiving a certain amount of it. Um, so we'll, we will go into that. If you have, if you're a cash buyer, or if you have 20, 30, 40, 50% um, down, uh, if you've got incredibly strong terms, or if you have a special type of loan where the appraisal might not matter as much, we may be able to waive this. <laughs> Even if we have a loan, if you waive the appraisal, you're making yourself that much closer to being to um, to competing with a cash buyer. So if you've got the ability, this is something we can consider. We'll talk specifically about this depending on the home that you're buying, how fairly priced we think it is, and what's happening in the market. We'll we'll look at what you know what kind of comps there are. Um, so we'll circle back to this, but I just want you to have the general sense. Any questions about appraisal? Oh. Well, so the big picture with appraisal, so if you guys are my buyers, I need to explain this to you. If you are offering $300,000 and the appraisal comes in at 290, dollars what this clause says is you are protected. You don't have to move forward with that loan unless the seller agrees to move to drop the price to 290. dollars So that's what this clause is doing. If the seller won't budge and you've got the money to make up the difference, you can still move forward. If you can't and they won't, then we can cancel the contract and you get your earnest money deposit back. Now, the reason we might want to add that clause is because this is now a risk to the seller if the home doesn't appraise. So we want to minimize the risk to the seller if we're in a competing offer situation. That's why you might want to consider um, adding, adding some information. Tracking? All right. So the first time that cash is coming out of your pocket is under clause eight for the earnest money deposit. We actually don't collect this check from you until after we get under contract. It's typically going to be somewhere between $1,000 to 1% of the purchase price. It's pretty typical for the Richmond area. Um, you can go higher than that if you want to. I've seen that it doesn't matter about going too high because there's too many ways for you to get it back. So the listing agents and the sellers um, you don't need to be throwing down 25000 or anything like that in most cases. Um, 
Uh, and again, we'll talk about that. We'll always check in with the listing agent. If it is important to them, we'll do more. Uh, but this is money that you want in your bank. It's going to come out of your bank account right away. So you need this cash to be fluid. Uh, the check is going to be made out to your closing agent. We'll help you determine who that is at the time we're running the contract also. And it's going to be, um, it's going to be turned in within five days. So if you have money in a fund that needs to, uh, it's going to take a week to wire, you need to do all that now. Get this money ready. If you break the contract for a valid reason, which we'll cover some of those clauses, you can get this earning money deposit back. If everything goes smoothly to closing, this these funds get credited towards your closing costs or down payment. So the money stays yours as long as you close. Any questions about earnest money deposit? Number nine is where we put in the closing date. If you're the only offer in, then we're going to do the closing date that's most ideal for you in your situation. Uh, we also want to be talking to the lender about the cost of rate blocks and anything else um, for the duration that, of, of that closing time. If you're in a competitive offer situation, we're going to ask the seller exactly when they want to close and we're going to give it to them. It's the seller's market, so that's something you need to prepare for. If the seller wants a 30-day close, we're going to give them a 30-day close. If they want 90 and a 30-day rent back or possession agreement, we may have to consider giving that to them. So as a buyer, you're going to have to have some flexibility if we're competing. Does that sound fair? Cool. Every clause has set expectations, right? Love it. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you were buying in a homeowners association, this clause is explaining that the seller has to order those documents. When they deliver it to you, you have an additional three days to review those documents. If there's anything you don't like, you can cancel the contract. So this is only for homeowners associations, um, not just any house that we're buying. This is your get out of jail free card. If they're smart, they will have already ordered the docs and they would have delivered it to you um, from day one. Uh, if we're lucky, maybe you don't get it until two or three weeks in. So if you do have inspections and those types of things, you might still have an out. We'll talk about this when, we're, when we know specifically what home that you're purchasing. This is the one thing that no buyer in Virginia is allowed to waive. So you all will be able to keep this, um, this protection. Any questions on HOA? Same with condo docs. What was the time frame? Three days? So. Three days. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's written specifically. And it's three days from when you received it, not from when you got it to your client. So if you didn't see it, and then you're on day two and you send it to your client, and they don't see it till day three. Okay. Yeah. So, so quick clarification, whenever whenever our contracts say X amount of days, um, it's the, it starts the day after. So if contract... So if they send it to you on Friday, then you have Saturday, Sunday, Monday are your three days. So, um, so yeah. So the HOA thing is something you want flagged everywhere in your system. So that's one of those things you want to get over exactly. Wait, I have a question. What yes. if you get it at 1 a.m. on Saturday morning? 1 a.m. Saturday morning, then Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Okay, so the first day truly never counts. The what? The first day truly never counts. Correct. Okay. Yeah, the date that it's delivered. That's my understanding from the RIR attorneys. Did anyone else heard it differently? Okay. It used to be. Yeah. Well, so they changed that wording in the last couple of years. Um, I missed it when they first changed it. Um, my team had to correct me on that a couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah, it used to say literally 72 hours. So if someone delivered it to you at 5 p.m. on a Friday, uh, it, was, it was up 72 hours later. Yeah. So if you had questions for the association, like, you couldn't get it, you know, you had one day um, to do it. Say that again. Correct. Right, right. Yeah, that became a thing this last year, too, because RAR um, didn't do a great job of explaining that up front, and it caused a lot of confusion. Uh, even if they had the HOA docs attached to a listing, so they've already been disclosed to you, it cannot start until the contract is ratified. So you still have three additional days after contract ratification to review those HOA docs. Um, the way I've always remembered it or thought through it is you get three full 24 hour days, mm -hmm. right? So like that helps me. And that doesn't mean I get to wait till midnight of the third day to get stuff done. 
right? You should do it yeah. before five. Yes. Yeah. yeah. For your for your contract to close processes, um, the HOA thing you want to flag as urgent and important, like drop everything, get that over to the client. And then the second thing is the day you get under contract, you want to put that deadline into your calendar. Mm -hmm. As soon as you are working with multiple buyers at once, it's not going to be as easy to keep this information in your head. So you want those contract deadlines in in your calendar. Um, I don't know how many years it took before I missed my first deadline. and It was pretty expensive mistake because uh, I then had to pay over a thousand dollars worth of repairs for my client because um, I felt so responsible. The seller might have said no to everything anyway, um, but the thing is, we didn't know, right? There was no yeah. chance to negotiate, so I will pay for my mistakes. Um, so don't miss that deadline. And I was lucky that it was only a thousand dollars because of the condo. Um, okay, so the next thing I like to talk to buyers about is property inspection. I'm going a little faster on that these days because um, we're not inspecting as much as this. Uh, but in the past, I have definitely spent like a good 10 minutes just talking about this clause and really setting expectations. Um, so in this market, if we're competing, uh, you it's potential there's potential that you may need to waive the inspection completely depending on your price range and what neighborhoods we're looking in. Um, if we do want to still have the inspection, we're going to be looking at the inspector schedule right away to see how quickly we can get them in. So then, can we off can we get it done in seven days or ten days? If there's no other offers, we're going to say we're going to get it done in 14 days. Um, that used to be the standard. Uh, so if we're not competing, we're going to give ourselves some time to get through the inspection. If we are competing, we want to do it as fast as possible. Uh, and then we also need to talk about um, if we're going to, even if we're going to do the inspection, are we going to waive part of the results? And we'll talk about that when we get to additional terms. Uh, one of the parts of the uh, this is um, this clause that I'd like to read verbatim uh, to the buyers and make sure we have clear understanding is this is not pass or fail. So you don't get to do the inspection and go, ew, I don't like this house anymore. I went out. No. Um, this is an FYI. Uh, these It's going to come up. So the home inspector is looking for major defects, but then they're making note of every small thing they come across along the way. Uh, a lot of that's going to be your little honeydew list for the next couple of years. Most of it does not need to be done right away. Seller's been living with it for years, had no idea. Um, you can live with it for a couple of years. If there's any big, hairy, scary things or something that could impact the value right away, then of course those are things that we want to address or make sure that if, if we can't ask the seller to do it, we want to make sure that you've got the funds to do it, right? Um, and so a lot of times focus on safety, noise, electrical, water. Water will cause, quickly cause more uh, more damage, uh, you know, the, that type of stuff. So, um, and if, if we're able to ask for repairs, then the contract says, uh, the contract protects you from defects and it defines defects here as a condition which impairs the normal stability, safety, or use, damage to any part of the building, but it excludes cosmetic laws, antiquated systems, or grandfathered components that are in working order but would not comply with the current building code if constructed or installed today. So since 50% of my business is in the city at older homes, I spend more time talking about this because it's a much bigger deal when you're working in older neighborhoods. I want to make it clear that like cracks in, in um, old plaster is a cosmetic flaw. This is not something that you get to negotiate. Um, antiquated systems, uh, the two most obvious ones would be like old boiler systems or impact systems and roof systems, right? So an inspector may come and say, well, that 1950s boiler is kicking today, but I can't promise you it's going to work tomorrow. First time home buyer starts freaking mm -hmm. out, says, I want a new boiler. I'm like, sorry, per the contract, you don't get to make that demand and you don't get out of the contract. So same thing with roof. Home inspector may say, hey, here's a couple small repairs that can be made, but I don't spend that $400 on repairs. Put that towards a new roof because it's near the end of its useful life. But if there's no leaks today, that seller is only responsible for that $400 of repairs. They're not responsible for a whole brand new roof. So this is where I educate the buyers. If the sellers can't tell us the age of the HVAC and the roof, you should assume that they're old. Assume that they have to be replaced in the next one to five years. And you need to have that in mind in your budget when you're making an offer. 
Then if we get to the home inspection and we find out the roof is only 10 years old, that's a good surprise and not a bankrupting surprise, right? Um, so that's part of the reason I spend time talking about this is I've learned what are the problems that have come up in my deals? How can I talk about that upfront to minimize surprises and minimize the level of crazy from first time buyers, right? Uh, grandfather components, some, the ones that are most common uh, in older homes will be like, kitchens may have been updated, but if, it ha if it's not a full renovation, they don't have to have updated like plugs every three years or whatever the code is. Um, you know, so updated electrical and, and all the um, other code requirements that are today. Stairways, uh, railings, porches, porch railings. A lot of those things on the historic homes, we don't want those things updated. It would be ugly. Uh, we like the historic look. So as long as someone hasn't ripped something down to the studs and rebuilt it, they're not required to bring it up to today's code. So those are the most typical things that are grandfathered. Does anything else stand out in your mind that has come up a lot? Like plumbing and stuff, like old, like cast iron. Right. Yeah. As long as it's not, they, they might be required to fix a leak, but they're not required to replace the plumbing. Right. Same thing. It could be lead pipe coming in. They don't have to replace it. Or they'll tear it so up. I think, yeah, um, I still have, um, uh, what's that electrical? Oh. Not, I still have knob and tube in my attic, so I can't put insulation in my attic unless I replace the knob and tube. It's perfectly fine. Yeah. As long as the connections are done right, it, that is grandfathered in. Um, so yeah, so electrical, plumbing, what are some of the other obvious ones? What were you gonna say, Anne? No, I was just gonna say, I think a good rule of thumb is if it was code compliant when the work was done, mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah, absolutely. And then oh. not in two, real quick, when we sold a house in the yeah. land, somebody was, the buyer, central buyer was complaining about it, and yeah. the electrician said, you know what, mice don't like it. And for that reason, he liked it better than the mice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Ooh, good. I know. I'm going to point that out. Yeah, because we've well, never. Your inspector, but that's better. We've had plenty of mice, but none of our courts have been. <laughs> true, true, true. So great. That's great. <laughs> good thing to share now. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so those are those are some of the things that often come up and are really frustrating as a listing agent to get in a fight with the buyer agent, the buyer about it, because it's like read the contract that these things are off the table. This, this shouldn't even be part of the discussion. And you also don't want your buyers to be surprised by these things going into older homes. Um, any other questions about that section? So the rest of this clause just explains the process about if we can do inspections, our deadline is submitting a request for repairs or credit. The seller then has time to take a look at it. There may be some back and forth in negotiation. If we come to terms, we all move forward. If we don't come to terms, if it's defects and the seller says, no, you will have the ability to get out of the contract if we haven't waived our ability to do that. So... Here's where we get to the additional term. You guys read this? Get a little bit bigger. So here are my, I, I write these in just because these are my reminders to talk to a buyer about, right? Um, if we are in a competitive offer situation, then we might want to strengthen that appraisal. So if you don't have so much cash, cash that we feel confident of waiving the appraisal completely, uh, then what we might want to do is add this clause to say how much you are willing to waive. Uh, and so those are numbers that you guys should start discussing now uh, it, because this is, there's a little bit of a risk. Uh, and of course, we'll talk about it with a specific home and kind of determine how much risk we think it is, um, how much room we think there will be in that appraisal. Uh, so if you are um, offering $300,000 and you say that you're willing to waive $10,000 of a shortfall of an appraisal, if that appraisal comes in at 280, dollars then the seller is responsible for 10, you're responsible for 10. So if the seller agrees to adjust the price for their amount, then we lower the price to 290, not to 280. And then you might be bringing an additional 10,000 or so to the, to the up table. It might not be a full 10, you're gonna talk with your lender because of your down payment amounts. You might be able to switch from 20% down to 10 
and maybe it's not more money out of your pocket, there's a number of ways that we can maneuver that. Uh, so this is that's a strategy we'll talk through depending on your loan terms and, and what you're doing with, with the seller. So I just want you to get prepared for that, figure out what what number may be your number. Um, and of course that may change you know, as we're going through the process. Any questions about the appraisal clause? Uh, another one that is really common if we're in a competing offer situation is doing something to strengthen that inspection. Uh, and so that is where there's two different ways we can write that one out. Purchaser waived an X amount of inspection repair costs secure that may arise during the inspection um, section. We don't have a typo in there. Um, and so that's one of those things where I usually will call the listing agent and find out which way they like the clause. The other way to do it is to say, I'm gonna weigh individual items under a cost of X. So when the market was somewhat heating up, but not quite as strong as it was this past year, we were maybe waiving items under 100 or 250. So it's like we we're taking all the, the nitpicky items off the table, we're telling the seller, um, you know, we're not gonna put everything on this report on an addendum, but we still wanna be able to talk about big things. As the market started heating up, we that started to rise to 500 per item, 1,000 per item, 2,500 per item, or we're doing, we'll waive a total of 5,000, 10,000, you know, kind of depends on what a buyer um, was able to afford. And a lot of buyers, if, if your full report comes out with $8,000 worth of repairs, a lot of buyers can actually afford to do those, especially because half of them don't have to get done right away. Yeah. And so you just, so the buyer needs to figure out what their budget is and how much they can put in the home in that first year. Mm -hmm. And then that's how you're going to write the strongest clause possible for that buyer. How much are they willing to pay or risk in order to get the home when it's kind of offer situation, right? Um, so you guys are getting a little bit of a contract writing class. <laughs> so, yeah. so I've always been confused by if they put the lump sum in there. So if they're willing to waive three thousand dollars so of an expense to dictate which items are waived. So let's say Yeah, it's the total, it's the grand yeah. total. So there's no dictation of items when when that happens. So so basically what happens, so let's say let's say the report comes back with um, ten thousand dollars worth of repairs, they wait three. Okay. The way um We'll see if Wilson agrees with me on this. The way I think I've always understood that is you can now ask for up to seven thousand dollars worth of credit or repairs. Um, now the tricky part with that, and part of the reason I used to not like the total amount, especially when it was a low, um, it was like I'm like that's bogus. Your inspectors can just throw a bunch of stuff in there and put large, you know, large estimates in there. It's so a waving two thousand dollars. It's like nothing. Like I would rather you weigh the individual items because sure. then I know for sure all of those things are redlined off of the report, right? Um, but then as those amounts have gotten bigger, uh, then I it, 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 there's more teeth to it. But every every um, agent's different. So even though I thought my way was right a couple of years ago, what we'd find is we would talk to the listing agents and the listing agents have it in their mind what they think is better and when it's a seller's market i do whatever that listing agent wants even if it's done <laughs> um, it's just yeah you know it's their way or their experience or you know whatever it is uh, so as long as it's not something that's gonna hurt your client then just default to what the listing agent said yes Shana. just to add to your to your point of setting expectations or educating them with regards to the inspection what what we also found was that if you that really helps them figure out what they can wait so really help taking the time to talk about the ages of the systems the what has been done to the house what hasn't been done in a long time all that sort of thing really helps you figure out what what is a logical thing to wait when it comes to those sorts of things um, as well as understanding what they can and what will show up in the session. Yeah. About helping them figure out that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's good. And that, that's also a good segue to the home warranties, yeah. where they might give some peace of mind. If things don't have to get replaced right away, that may help give them some coverage. And that's my gap for the next skip over. First time home warranty, you think? Before that. Um, Oh, it's right about it. So item 20. So um, when it was a buyer's market, 
I put this in like every contract that I wrote. So I'm just going to pay for a warranty. Let them say yes or no. Um, in this market, stop putting in completely, keeping the contracts as clean as possible. I usually won't even put that the buyer is paying for it. Because if you have it in there at all, um, how many agents are high D, not detail oriented, and just see that something's been checked and then react to it, right? And this one, like, that literally happens. Yeah, that literally happens. yeah. 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 Um, so we, even if a buyer wants one, we don't have to put it in this contract. The buyer can buy it at any time. Uh, so we can have that going on on the side. And, um, it, you know, if we want it to start the day of closing, if we need an addendum. Someone tells us we need an addendum, we can do that later. It's not going to cost the seller anything. That's no problem. Keep the contracts as clean as possible if you're in a competing offer situation. Um, and this is also still an opportunity to talk to the buyer that home warranties don't cover everything. However, there are a lot of things that can cover. So if you're willing to deal with the hassle of, of calling them and everything, this may give you some peace of mind and save you some money to be able to replace some things. So you don't decline it then. And then just with your. Yeah. Okay. In the contract, I keep it clean. Okay. okay. Buyers can always add it later. Cool. That's my style. This is not necessarily a right or wrong. Uh, but I, so. I keep, saying, I keep talking about D's and C's. Um, Keller Williams used to talk about the DISC profile a lot. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but D-I-S-C, D is a high driver. Um, so that's, that's, that's your agent who wants to win. And it's just like walks really fast through the hallway. And then the I's are the ones who are always ready to party and will talk to any random stranger when they're in the grocery store in line. Um, the S is the one who security, usually they're part of the admin team, right? They want the salary and, and the nine to five job. The C's are the, the um, high detail, dot the I's, crossing the T's, compliant, um, appreciate the rules, details, that kind of thing, right? And so uh, that's your quick overview when I'm talking about those different profiles. Um, and it's notorious for a lot of the sales agents to be really low on the C. That's why so many people will hire help pretty early on. Um, and so that's where, if I, um, if you don't know what personality you're presenting to, then you want to kind of cover your bases. You know, you want to speak the language to a D, I, S, and C, right? So start with something friendly in your email. I give the highlights so that high D get what they need right away. Um, and then provide all the information uh, as attachments so that C then has everything they need to go through, right? So you want to communicate um, to, to all of them. That's also part of, part of where you want the contract as clear as possible, as clean as possible. And when you have these special clauses in, I usually put that in my cover letter, uh, the cover email. Um, so again, that high D may not get, may, may not even get to page six of the contract. So I'm going to tell them in the email, here are the things we're giving you. Here's where it is. <laughs> Your contract. I have to add, um, as Rick Cockrell has said over and over, as our broker, if your buyer is declining warranty coverage in order for you to get a waiver on your $2,500 deductible, if you have an E&O, people will look at you and say, yes, I know you've told me three times about a warranty I'm declining. If you don't get it in an email, um, just confirming you are declining the warranty, please confirm, correct. Because if they, if something goes south, and they file an ENO against you, that's one of the criteria that you have to have in writing to waive your deductible with our insurance is that you have in writing that you have offered a home warranty and you have in writing that it was declined. Well, Always. I always like some follow conversations with Rick about that. One, I never do that. And two, I've never done that. In the contract right here, in the contract right here, they're either electing or they're not electing. So it's in writing right here. The one thing I make sure they sign the addendum is if they choose not to have a home inspection. But a home warranty has no bearing on. It is one of those contract. because most ENO claims, or let me rephrase that, a lot of ENO claims are when something breaks after closing and they say, my agent never recommended that I get a warranty. That's one of the most common ENO complaints. So that's why. In all of this other information, it gets buried and lost in that decline category. And so Rick has said to have it in writing in an email. What I think 
would be ideal then is for our office to come up with a warranty disclosure. Uh, and I would like to include it in my bar consultation and it should be generic enough to say, I've been told that home warranties exist. I may purchase one at any time. It may or may not be included in my contract. I understand I have the option to get one on my own. Okay. So that way it's not tied yeah. to a contract. They're not declining or accepting, but they're acknowledging that this has been disclosed to them. Okay. I would love a uh, let me I'll get with work on warranty that. disclosure. I'll get with work on that. And Patrice, I don't want to single myself out, but since I've been following the DAR contract as you're going through RAR, uh -huh. yeah. It, it doesn't even address that. Right. Doesn't address a lot right. of things as well. So if we're going to if we That's need to address separately. it, yeah. then yeah. the idea of that exposures. Yeah. I'll find out. Oh, it's really important to, because most of us wouldn't know that's right. a thing because none of us have had a DNO right. issue right. yet, right? I think. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> I'll, I'll get um, with Rick on it. Yeah, so yeah. that so he's got insider knowledge. So if we need better CYA, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. I am more than happy to have that conversation up front, and it should be generic enough that we can have them sign it really early on. Like, yeah. hey, by the way, buy this anytime. Yeah. And if a buyer calls me first and lets me know they're having a problem, I'll be like, hold up, let's put a home warranty on it. Call tomorrow and let them know what you have. <laughs> yeah. Do the right thing. <laughs> Uh, la, 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 all right. La, la, la. <laughs> okay, so a bunch of legalese. If we're buying somewhere with well septic, normally that's the seller's responsibility for competing offer. We may have to waive those inspections or do it during your inspection or study period. So that's something we'll talk about when it comes to particular. And yeah, do you want to address the uh, choices there on no. that? Okay, I'm just talking to a buyer. Okay, buyer console right now. Okay, not contract right now. Okay. Uh, usually the termite inspection is the one inspection the seller is required to do. Uh, again, if we're competing, this may be one more thing that we waive. If we have an inspection period, we can quickly get the, the termite inspection done at that time. It's $75. So it's not that much to add to your other inspections. Um, so it just depends on how, how many things we end up having to strike through a contract to, to be competitive or not. This is something that's usually not touched. It's not that big of a deal to sellers usually. Um, so we'll just see what happens when we get to it. Uh, and then we are um, giving the sellers an acceptance deadline. Usually 24 hours is pretty normal. Um, it might be a little bit longer depending on how they have, you know, deadlines for submitting and that type of thing. Um, so we'll, again, kind of strategize on that when we, when we um, come to it. Uh, once, you, once that deadline passes, this contract is no longer um, yeah. valid. Uh, so they can't suddenly sign it a week later while you've already moved on and are negotiating something else, right? So we want a deadline in here, but we can still give them some time depending on what the situation is. Any questions about that? All right, cool. So that took a lot longer because I was interrupting myself. I was explaining the whys. I was talking to you about some strategy. Um, but any, any ahas that you had from this section? I know you already chimed in to say, okay, I see why you do this. I, there's so much training I'm yeah. doing as I'm going through, right? Setting expectations, future pacing, yeah. and a lot of tie downs, like a lot of you will do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Going through the contract with the buyer is so important. That, and like, it's important that you understand it and you're super confident yourself to go through it. So that yeah. was not helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. And notice outside of the inspections addendum or the inspection clause, there was nothing that I read verbatim. I'm not getting stuck in read mode. That'll make the contract, the meeting draws out a lot longer and it's yeah. more boring for your buyer. So I'm giving the top points and I'm telling them you can read this later. I'm not keeping the details from you, but you know, all of this is in your email. Through, you don't read through every section. You read through the contingencies <laughs> that we need to focus on. Yeah. Correct. 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 What do what do I need them to be educated on to be able to write an offer tomorrow? And if they're super high D, just say read it and let me know if you have any questions. Like the oh, you should have warned it. You should be off of this whole thing to the warning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So high D will still get the review. Yeah. If they've never bought a house before, if they're experienced, I may point out the three main things, like sure. appraisal or inspection. Like here's what we're doing right now in this market. It's here's what's different. Yeah. yeah, you bought a house 10 years ago. We still need to talk. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well said. So, like going over that, like once my buyer is going through the contract, it's like you're done. I get that in 30 seconds. I've never looked at it. Right. 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 Right
Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So that that's one of those things where um, it is absolutely possible to go show a house tomorrow, get a buyer to write an offer, win, and get them under contract, and not do any of this. It is a hundred percent possible. Those high D buyers. Um, I definitely lost one. So I was like, we, we need to have this appointment. She's like, no, I'm going to go look at houses. And then we the contract for the weekend with someone else and it was under contract. And, um, and there are absolutely buyers like that. You can make a business decision about whether you're willing to run out with them or not. Um, but for me, like I've learned over time that if you don't do the stuff up front, then they are a pain in your butt. Every step, everything that happens between now and closing, I didn't know that. You know they're highly emotional they're super reactive um and even when you, even when you've prepped people they're still going to have some some personalities are still going to have high emotions during the process but it's so much nicer when i'm able to go well you remember when we reviewed this um during the consult what we talked about then and uh and i know it's a lot of information to retain at once let me walk you through it again right so it's like i'm kind of bringing them down a notch like hey you know the accusation of never hearing those, like this isn't your email, or, you know. Um, so it's 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 nice to be able to go back and rehash it and say, remember when that it is to be like, you're right, you didn't know this, and you're screwed out. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, so that that is the bulk of it. It's 12, 7 to 18. Um, how are we on energy? Are you guys? Are you guys still with me? Great, my coffee is still still working. Yeah, got, you got like uh, a bunch of people. Okay. There's more than what you see there. There's like. Do you want to check and see if there's any questions from them? There, uh, okay. anyone from home? Do you have questions for us? Will we hear them on the mic? Yeah. No. Okay. Well, they'll come through on the yeah computer. Okay. There, there was a question um, that someone asked when you were talking about escalation clauses. How mm -hmm. do you know when to do them or when not? Mm -hmm. And and I said one of the things is one in MLS, it'll say if they're not accepting them at all. And you should always call the list agent to see, hey, yes. we're thinking about doing this. How do you feel if we were to submit? Yeah. Yeah. And yes. that's what I answered. And then someone else, when you were talking about the contract of what other things are included and Ann brought up, we've been told to do it on a separate, and yeah. they said they just went through Michael Lafayette's class, yeah. and he said always do it separate. So I know there's, it's just like you talk to any attorney, and you can talk to five and get five different interpretations of the law. So there's, there's always going to be different opinions and things yeah. like that. But yeah, last of the things. Hi, excuse me. Oh, hello. <laughs> hello. Hi, this is this is James James Jones. Hey, James. Uh, I had hi, I had the question about the escalation. I, I rephrased the question. What I was trying to ask is I've submitted an offer with an escalation clause. What is best practices uh, for verifying that the escalation clause needed to be invoked? In other words, I don't want my buyer to pay more than they have to. And this and this and the seller has said, hey, we went with the escalation clause. As a buyer rep, how do I verify that it was needed? Yeah. So the escalation clause, I don't, I don't think I put my in here. So you the escalation clause should include the phrase that is contingent upon uh, the listing agent or you know the seller furnishing the proof the, of a valid. Yeah. yeah. And and I put the word net in my clause. Yes. So if someone offered the same price but asked for ten thousand closing costs, that doesn't call our highest. You know, that doesn't yeah. call our escalation. So, yeah, yeah, and in the new the new RAR escalation clause is its own page. Have you guys seen that? Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it, I think it's pretty clear about that um, that they're supposed to. And so, um, a good listing agent will go through and black out um, any contact information, but you'll be able to see um, the contract terms. Um, I have pushed back at the listing agent and and like either changed the wording in the contract or just got them to agree that we're going to send like one page or two pages, right? Because it's really tedious for me to use my um, special PDF thing to black out on every single page the name of the buyer's agent because it's all down below, right? In small print. 
because uh, I don't want buyers agents calling each other. Right. Right. I don't want them to know that the other one exists because what if this one falls through or what if, or, you know, all of the things it's in your seller's best interest for them not to know about each other. So if we have to submit something, then I'm usually going to have, um, uh, you know, make some adjustment ahead of time about what we're going to send over because it's just so tedious. Um, or that's where we've got to the point where we say, okay, I'm, I'm telling you what your competition's doing. Remove the escalation clause. If you go, you know, if you give us X, Y, and Z, then that's what you need to, to be able to compete. And so maybe we've got yeah. the escalation clause at that point. Um, but yeah, the clause itself should, should, should ask for that proof. And sometimes you're not going to get it. And that's where I've explained to, um, I was negotiating a deal and the buyer's agent refused to remove the escalation clause. And we were, we were in that position where um, the difference of $1,000 didn't make her offer better. This other offer was going to be better unless they raised the price. And she didn't get it. She didn't remove it. We chose this other offer. She was livid with me saying, I gave you everything you wanted. I'm like, no, you didn't. You didn't remove the escalation clause. That, and it's like, you know, you can only explain it so much as a listing agent without sharing. There's only so many details. and You can give them enough detail, but you can't get super specific, right? Fiduciary duties to your seller. Um, some of that information is still confidential, right? Um, and so... That is where you have to be able to turn around and explain to your buyer why sometimes the escalation clause has to be removed. And at the end of the day, if they get the house that they love, because sometimes they're like, what if we're getting screwed? What if we're getting screwed? <laughs> like, are you really getting screwed if you get what you love? Right? At a price you can right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. At a price you were willing to pay. So, um, so as a buyer's agent, you have to be really skilled at walking your buyers through their emotions. That's not the listing agent's job. So you have to be good at walking yourself through your emotions <laughs> <laughs> and not add to it. Because um, there, there, there is a lot, there is a lot of fear-based decision making out there. So you need to make sure you're not feeling the fire of that fear. You have to be able to talk through. Yeah. Anyway, we might be going you're, off topic. Yeah, yeah, you need to be calm you. in the storm. Yeah, I hope that helped. Thanks. Thanks for the good question, James. Um, okay. So yet to make this happen my city. Uh, all right, so through the presentation, I'm then going to quickly point out to them at the same time we're signing we're, uh, signing that contract, we're making an offer, you're also going to be signing this residential pro property disclosure statement. It gives you a link to go to all the items that the seller doesn't have to tell you about. Um, the next document we're going to click on is the summary. We are going to go through a couple of those highlights. Uh, so the seller will have already signed. You're going to sign this is going to be sent with the purchase agreement as part of your offer package. Oh, okay. When you first put it on, you're signing it first? You yeah. Even... No, just let you know it's coming. So anything that my buyer, the most difficult things that my buyer will be signing, I'm giving to them up front. So the day that they fall in love with the house and are writing an offer, it's not the first time they've seen any of the things. So here's a summary of the Residential <laughs> Property Disclosure Act. If you want to read this in detail, it is in your email. Uh, I'm just going to talk about a couple of high-level things with you. Um, condition, Virginia is very much a buyer beware state. Seller doesn't have to tell you anything. Get any home, any inspections you deem necessary, and it's at your cost. Uh, and, um, yeah, adjacent parcels, the second one, adjacent parcels, the seller doesn't have to tell you if there's anything happening around their building. So if they're next to a halfway house, uh, if they've got um, – uh, farmland behind them or apartment building behind them, they don't have to tell you about any parcels that are touching or around them. So drive yourself around and go talk to the neighbors if there's anything you care about. Sometimes I talk more in detail about these things, sometimes I skip through. Rate on gas, that's one of the inspections that we might want to do during the inspection period. It usually costs about $160, $75 um, for a kit. Rate on gas comes from the ground. There's no rhyme or reason why it's in one house or not another. I recommend doing it in any house. Um, and you will be reminded of that when it comes to the inspection period. The sellers do not have to disclose it. It is considered a defect though, if it is above, if the, if the readings come in above a 4.0. Uh, so if we are able to negotiate repairs, this can go on that list. I highly recommend um, getting this test done. 
radon gases have been linked to certain cancers. It is one of the few things that the EPA has given clear cut guidelines on. Like mold, there's zero guidelines about it. Radon is 100% clear cut, problem or not a problem. By pipes, owner doesn't have to tell you about it. I don't know how to recognize them. Um, <laughs> so that's something we need to keep in mind with older houses. You might be uh, replacing some connections that hasn't been done yet. The city did have a program for a while. I don't know if it's still intact. Those are things we immediately research if it comes up as a problem. Uh, this last part are the things the seller does have to tell you. So these are the few disclosures a seller would be required to make. One of those is if it was a former meth lab and hasn't been cleaned up yet, then they, they must disclose that. Thank you, Virginia. Um, so this is something that I will send to you to sign along with the buyer agency agreement um, to show that it's been disclosed to you. Uh, when you review it on your own, let me know if you have any questions. That allows me to get through it a little faster during the buyer consult. How do I get it? Like, move that down. Okay. Then I'm also giving them the lead based paint disclosure. If the house was built for, before 78, the seller is also going to provide this to us. They're going to initial where they're supposed to, whether they have knowledge or they don't have knowledge. You're going to initial that you've received all this information uh, and everyone signs on the bottom, including us agents. So at the time of contract, uh, this is one more thing that you'll be signing will be part of your contract offer package. And then we would also be including your lender pre-approval letter, of course, which is why you need that done before we go look at house. So any questions about that stuff? So contract offers. Perfect. All right, so here's our buyer brokerage guide. Um, this is something that I don't spend a ton of time uh, talking about the fluffy pages. This is where we do our, you know, we work by referral, five star customer service, we want to earn your referrals, blah, 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 speech. Uh, I will have already done what is kind of covered on this page. My needs analysis is normally done before the buyer consultation. So I already talked to them about their ideal timeline, ideal goal, all that stuff, right? So I'm skipping forward to the buying process. Uh, and so this is the timeline. Um, let me get this out of the way. Okay. Uh, so for us, this is our fancy little, what's that called? Roadmap. Yeah. Roadmap? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's, Lots of different ones that you can rip off of online uh, on Pinterest, I think is one of the sites. There's some good ones on there. Uh, I think, does Ignite have and I a think, big one? Because um, my original one came from PW Material. I think they do, but time. I think RIR also has some material okay. you can use. Yeah, There's online collateral on uh, RIR. Cool. So the, the nuggets are the most important part um, and just being able to walk you know, buyers through what to expect. So, of course, the first step is getting pre-approved the lender, uh, which at this point, a lot of my buyers already have done. We're like, great, we've checked that off. Um, the next step is buyer consultation, which we're doing right now. And then um, maybe we have or we're about to set up the MLS portal um, that gives you direct access. So you'll be alerted as soon as houses hit the market. Um, your first step is to drive by them. Make sure you like the location. Uh, do they do tricky photography to hide the fact that it's like this crazy plant uh, and that's a deal breaker for you? You know, so go do a drive by, then let us know uh, if you want to see the home and then we'll schedule a showing. Uh, this is a great time to then explain um, if there's days and times that you don't do showings or how it works. Like normally we need, we need to schedule showings in advance. Um, it's very rare that the seller can let us in same day or that our schedules can allow for that. Now, my one caveat will be if the spring market is crazy again, and if they're not holding offers, then when you're at a point where you know you love a house and you love a neighborhood, you call us, we're going to do everything possible to get you in um, as, as quickly as we can, depending on when they're allowing showings. Uh, and you might not have time to do a drive-by before we do that. So um, some, of, some of that system part of it, some of that process might have to get truncated to match the market that we're in. Uh, but so, so as soon as you are excited about a house, send it to us and we're looking up 
um, if, if it was posted on Monday, but they're not allowing showings on Friday, we immediately let them know, right? Okay, we can all breathe. Showings don't start till Friday. And then, you know, we're picking out what block of time we want to go do showings and then hope there's a couple others we can see at the same time. Um, so, so we're reporting back whether we can get in right. Is, is this urgent? And we all, it's all hands on deck today. Or are we, are we scheduling for future? Yeah. Okay, so I don't have one uh, on my process that is for my business, but yeah. I send all my clients to the VA. They have a free home buyers class that teaches them A to B. So how important is that to have one you know, for my clients? Or I think my glass is a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> I think what I review with them is a lot more advanced. I don't think VHDA is going through the contract and saying, if you're the only offer versus if you're competing, if you're the only competing, only competing, right? They're not talking strategy. They're not future pacing. They're talking real generic stuff. I took that class years ago. And yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a bad thing to do. I think the more education, the better. Uh, I think you want to get yourself more knowledgeable than VHDA as soon as possible. So that you've got value, you can bring them that not every agent is doing, right? Um, I don't know. Does anyone else have anything to add to that? Okay. I have a question about yeah. the order of operations. So, do you yeah. go in this actual order? So, it's contracts first and then it's the presentation? Yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, and there's not a right or wrong. For some reason, well, because I think I cover so much of the contract that when I get here, it's like, we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about this. Um, but I like the context within the contract. Because otherwise, so if I start talking about home inspections here and they start asking me questions, yeah, I like the fact that I can go into those details in the in the context of the contract. So that's that's usually been my flow. Um, but it, it hasn't always been that way. Some, sometimes, yeah, it depends on. Um, on the timing. So so let's say let's say you wanted to punt part of the console to later because they're not going to buy it for six months. Mm -hmm. You might whip this out. You know, if you're having an initial meeting with them, you might whip this out just to give them highlights mm -hmm. without going to all that detail. And then do the contract which pulls you to the Yeah, yeah. That's perfectly acceptable too. What's great is you've got you've got either or to kind of yeah, figure it out on the fly. Yeah. Like if I've got the high D who's already already swarming in their seat, you know, before we even start, then I know I got to get through some stuff. And there are times where um, I've given one spouse permission to leave, and I've stayed with the engineer part of the couple, the high detailed person, and I will meet with that person for two hours while you know, and like what's up? It's spouse who doesn't care go. Um, <laughs> So those are things, yeah. I, I, you know, you read the energy and you give people permission. Um, or I let them space out and get on their phone or whatever. And then I do the little table tap and I'll be like, so Danielle, this, this is one section that I think will interest you. And then when I'm done with that section, I'll like physically put my attention back on the trees and Danielle knows she can go back and get on her phone. Um, so there's like little tricks like that where it's like, okay, I need you with me. You got this? Okay, good. Like. You know, yeah, yeah. Back, back to the 10 questions the other spouse is asking me that you don't care about, yeah. right? Um, but what about this scenario? But what about this scenario? But, you know, my neighbor I, said, yeah. yeah. Um, I know I'm a pain in the ass, and so like attracts like. So <laughs> I get a lot of those people. Oh, is ASS one of them? Yeah. 25? Okay. Yeah. It's a pain in the butt. Um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, I, I, get, I get a lot of those personalities in my, in my sphere. Um, and it's so funny when you're like, they're asking all these detailed questions, and it's like, <laughs> and how are you covered? <laughs> love it, love yeah. it. Um, so, so yeah, so then we're walking through. Oh, yeah. Um, so explaining, yeah, we want them to drive by before, and then we're doing showings. Usually, we're looking up to five homes at a time. Don't give me a list of thirty. Uh, uh, what we found, five is a magic number. If you look at more than five at one time. And not only is it exhausting, it's really confusing. So if you've got 10 that you're liking, you're going to drive by them, see if you can narrow it down, then you're picking your five favorite, or we're picking it by location. And then we may split it into two, two searches, right? Um, can I make a recommendation on that too? Because yeah. I had someone that would look at the pictures and they're like, oh, I want to go see this one. I want to go. And I'm like, 
that's the neighborhood that you said you didn't like because pictures online are great. Mm -hmm. So it's important for you to keep up with what neighborhoods they did drive out and they didn't like for whatever reasons that you go, nope, that was one you didn't like the neighborhood. Is that still the case? Yep. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to call your client out in a super professional, like helpful yeah. way, right? To be like, um, and that's where you can say, well, you know, when we went over our must haves, this was one of your must haves. This house had that thing, uh, or, or a deal breaker, right? Um, do you want to reconsider your deal breaker or your must have? Or is there a reason why you would compromise on this one? I'm like, oh, I totally missed that. Thank you for bringing my attention. We can drop it. Yeah. Nine times out of 10, that'll happen. Every now and then, they'll come up with why they're willing to compromise. And then you're showing it anyway. But you're you're showing that you're keyed into what they want. Yep. It's never about wasting my time. It's about, I want you to have the best energy when you're looking at these homes. Because the more you see, the more exhausted you get. Yeah. Uh, um, so what are the other expectations about that? So we want to look no more than up to five homes in this market. We might only be looking at one, right? One, two, or three. Um, uh, and then there's also, so we already said a lot of times we need time to get it scheduled. We can't always get you in day of seller schedule and, you know, all the things. Um, was there anything else that we said? for how to set up showing. Oh, this is where you might have to tell them the best way to tell you, Thank right? Like, is it easier for you to be tech? Like, so you might want, I, so I like to um, try to coach them. The fastest way is if you copy and paste the MLS number and send that to me. Have you ever had anyone misspell the street name? Oh yeah. Oh my God. Trying to find anything in the MLS when something's misspelled is such a nightmare. So I like it, but it's easiest for me. And I tell them you'll get faster service if you email the MLS number. Now, the only thing you can do is send me the address. That's totally fine. We'll do the best we can. Um, but fewer mistakes are made if you, if you copy and paste the MLS number and send it to us that way. You can text me an alert, but try to give me the information through email if you can. Um, that way I'm quickly copying and pasting, getting all the houses pulled up in one search. Then I can map them faster, print them out faster, you know, do, do all the steps faster. So these are all the, um, every step that you're talking about is where you get to coach your buyer how to treat you. Like, how do you want them get communicating with you? How do you want the information coming back? Um, and again, this is, I was maxed out at one point, right? So how streamlined can I make every step? Of course, with customer service, I also want to meet a buyer where it's easiest for them. However, if they can do any of, if, if they can send the information to me anyway, why don't I at least tell them the best way, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a little thing that can, that can help uh, set the stage there. Uh, so what I don't want them to do is heart something in the MLS and write a note and then not tell me about it. I'd be like, how come you haven't called me? I hearted. Homes in the MLS. I'm like, oh my God, I have 50 searches set up. I'm not getting in every single one of them. Um, and so that, again, when you have more than one or two buyers, it starts to get harder to do that super customized, you know, paying attention to every little thing. So that's where you want to tell them. Um, it's, you could make all the notes in there, but I'm not going into your search unless you tell me to. Um, that's pretty rare, but that's one thing. Um, all right, so very normal. When we follow this process, if you think about, so the home, the home search is a big funnel. So there's thousands of homes on the MLS. We're putting in your search criteria. That's narrowing it down in a huge way. You're then looking at things online, narrowing it down further. You're driving it by, driving by them, narrowing it down further. So it only takes one to five homes to find a house that you want to make an offer on. And it could be the first house you walk into that's perfectly normal. We'll probably still go look at the others because it just helps, you know, even if you already know you're in love, it sometimes it helps to see the others to know that truly that was the one. <laughs> um, and so uh, it is very normal to be writing an offer after our first outing. Uh, and and um, that's where we already talked a lot about the contract and the different terms. We'll get a lot more details with that situation when you identify the house. And when we, when the seller and you agree to all the terms, we then have a ratified contract, you were under contract. That's when from here to the end is the contract to close process. It's typically anywhere between 30 to 60 days, very normal. 
Um, if a seller wants it to close really fast, we'll go to your lender and find out, can we do it in 21 days? If you're cash, do we do it in 10 to 14? Some of the title companies can't do it that fast right now, but um, you just gotta have the right people working on it. Uh, and then if it's a if it's a seller who goes on the market in March, but wants to stay in their home until the, until the uh, school season's over, school, whatever, year? <laughs> Kids. <laughs> Then it may be a 90 day closing or it may be a 60 day closing and then the possession agreement, you know, that type of stuff. So I'm just setting an expectation of how long that part takes, right? Um, and that we need to be prepared for any of those scenarios. Um, and so, oh, by the way, if you're not ready to close on a house in 30 days, we shouldn't be looking at homes. With that, or you've got to be willing to get flexible, right? Uh, after you get under contract, we're going to send all the documents to the lender um, on your behalf. They're going to reach out to you to do a formal loan application that happens in the first seven days. There's money deposit gets turned in within five days. So that's that money that's coming out of your account right away. It comes back to you at closing as long as we get to closing. Uh, the HOA documents we talked about, three days to review. Home inspection period we talked about, are we waiting or are we not waiting? How many days do we have? Uh, do we get to ask for repairs or is it as is? Uh, those are all the details that depend on what house we found. Uh, the appraisal normally gets ordered after the home inspection, depending on how fast the closing is, we might have to do it sooner. Uh, in, in, a, in a balanced market, I'm usually telling the lender, do not order this until we're done with home inspection negotiations. Because um, I don't want my buyer getting charged for something they don't need. In this market, sometimes we're just having to get things done faster. And the buyer might, if the buyer's waived anything, they want that appraisal done right away because they need to know what they're up against money-wise. It, it gives them more time to strategize. So in this market, that's shifted a little bit, but in the more balanced market, we don't want that ordered until after inspection is done. Um, <laughs> oh, insurance. Oh, okay, so that's like usually a couple of weeks in into it. Once you've gotten through these other big rocks, you're gonna be ordering homeowner's insurance. Uh, you'll call whoever you have as your car insurance rep, and then we'll also give you a couple of other people if you want it's just a great time to shop around all of your insurance if you want to. Uh, the utilities um, will usually give you a reminder seven to ten, ten days out from the closing date um, so that you can call and put the utilities in your name uh, as of the closing day. Everything that I'm reviewing right now is all going to be sent to you again in the next steps email after we get in our contract. So I don't expect you to memorize this. I just want you to have an understanding of the big picture things before I get you under contract. Make sense? And that next step, the email would be a great thing to put in the smart plan that you know is going to be triggered to always go out. So you're not having to remember. Yeah, yeah. And so I have a, I um, wrote up a template many, many years ago. Um, what are the things that you say over and over again to your buyers? Any of that can be turned into a template. And then I highlight the parts that need to be customized for to match that contract, right? Um, so Closing confirmations, a lot of time you're not getting those final numbers from the lender until you get within three days of closing. Sometimes it's the day of. I know it's really stressful, but sometimes the lenders aren't able to finalize the numbers until the very end. They're going to give you estimates going up to that. So if you need to wire funds, they're going to tell you how much to wire. If it's too much, they'll give you money back on the closing table. Um, if it's just a little, if you're a little bit under, you can write a personal check. So all of that's normal. Um, and, and to be expected, there's just a lot of moving pieces at the end. And so that's why you don't always have exacts, but you will be getting estimates along the way. And then the final walkthrough, a lot of times I'll suggest doing that um, the day before, or whenever the seller tells us they're completely out is when we'll then schedule the walkthrough. So if they're out early, we can do it anytime between then and the closing date. Um, uh, but they're not required to be out before your closing day. So we might not be able to do it before the night before or the morning of. Um, the sooner we do it, the better. If there's a surprise or problem, it gives us more time to solve it. Um, but if we do it early, I want you driving by that property on the day of. Maybe we go in again. Um, but at least while you're doing a drive-by, because if a tree fell down overnight, we want to say, time out. We are not closing. Seller, you call your insurance and pay your $1,000 deductible. Get this fixed. We'll close when it's done. Uh, so you want to make sure, you know, there has it like pipes in first, 
or a tree fall down or any major thing that you don't want to walk in on closing day and find. Because as soon as you sign those closing documents, the seller can't do anything about it with their homeowner's insurance. Um, one, they're not, and they're not required to legally, so it's not like they're a fork over their own cash. Uh, but they also, they can't even call their homeowner's insurance anymore because it is no longer their property. And, I, and to her point, the day of, I knew an agent that it was a property in the city and somebody was watching the house, saw that they moved out like the day or two before closing, they went and stole the HVAC unit. And so, yeah, I mean, like the, those are the things that you need to be aware of. They do happen. Is it common? No, but it can happen. Yeah, uh, I was a listing agent when a tree, there was a tree that fell down and I got called after closing and they're like, oh my God, a tree fell down. And I was like, do you close? I, I literally, like there's nothing I can do about it. Um, and so, yeah, so whether, whether I was on the listing side or whether I'm on the buyer side, any of these examples I'm sharing are true stories. Yeah. All these things happen. We showed up for the walkthrough and the washer dryer were missing, right? The, the, the movers took them by accident. Yeah. And so we're like, oh, time out, we're not closing. The agent grabbed a trailer, ran out, got the washer dryer, brought it back to the house same day, and, and we completed closing, right? So it, you everything that you've written in the contract, you wanna go through and make sure those things are still in the home. Um, sometimes it's deliberate, sometimes it's by accident. Uh, so you just, those are the things that you guys want to check for. Yes. This is maybe a little random, but I'm sorry. Just, what is your name? Felicia. Felicia. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, just for the liability. Sometimes I feel like I might do a little bit too much for my mm -hmm. clients and I'm kind of putting myself out there. So I went to do a um, final walkthrough 24 hours before close. Yeah. To the washer and dryer. This house was staged. When the stagers came back to pick up all the stuff, yeah, they took the refrigerator. So I'm oh. always like, hold on, I'm pretty sure there was a refrigerator. <laughs> yeah. So I look at all my stuff, it was a caller, and she comes back the next day, it's there for close. Yeah. My client wasn't with me, she was a nurse, she was at work. I did the walkthrough kind of for her. Yeah. Is that a bad idea? Sometimes you have to. Yeah, I mean, we've got clients who are out of town. Um, yeah. 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 As long as long, I, I, so it's always great to recap any phone conversations mm -hmm. and and put things in the emails mm -hmm. so you have a paper trail. Um, make sure you're giving them the option. Okay. So that you're not. Don't tell them. Oh, I'm going to do this for you. Stay with you. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and I think it's great to do it on your own beforehand. Say, oh my gosh, look how amazing I am for you. I just. I just solved this problem. That was and, my goal. Yeah. yeah. And you can still, um, so I love setting them up an hour before closing. So the buyers are already taking time off. They, we already have appointment schedule. So they meet me at the house. I tell them a typical walkthrough is 10 or 15 minutes. Um, just go, you know, we're, here's the checklist. We're making sure there's a client in here, whatever else. Make sure there's no leaks and make sure there's no tree that's fallen. Uh, and then get them to their closing. Uh, so even if you do it, that's amazing customer service and I don't think you should stop. So you can go look for the obvious problems ahead of time. If you can still invite them to come meet you right before closing. And then if they are, um, like we've had a couple of out of town clients the last couple of years, uh, buying houses site unseen or whatever else. If they have any family member in the area, I want that family member to meet me there. I want someone else to blame too, yes. as much as me. Um, you know, I want someone else that they know about that's not part of the sale to say, hey, I didn't notice that. I didn't see that, right? Um, just to add some some balance to it. Uh, I can or to do a video walkthrough. And so um, I, you know, you can be on FaceTime or whatever it is and say, what else do you want to see? Like here are the things that are always on my checklist. What else do you want me to, to walk through and show you? Um, so I might not notice a stain on the floor or something. I live in a house that was built in 1920. Like nothing is level, <laughs> you know, no, nothing is normal. Um, so I can be high detail when it comes to a contract. I'm not high detail when I'm walking through a house. Uh, so I'm just used to everything being messed up. <laughs> so, I guess. Doing a video walkthrough, do you feel like you need to do anything else to cover yourself? Maybe do this by video and put this on everything signs in here or just, just treat it like a normal live walk here? What do you, do you send a follow-up email? I don't send a, well, the video, I've, I've only done virtual walkthroughs. 
through. So I like live with me and I that's really and I, that's all yeah, and I I verbally go through everything that I'm doing. If I'm turning on an oven, making sure that it's, the burners are still on, and I'm saying I'm turning on this oven, all the burners look good. I'm turning everything off. If I say it out loud too, I know that I've done it. Mm -hmm. And so I just I, everything I'm doing, I'm saying out loud. I'm going over where I knew there was furniture and saying, you know, I'm not seeing where the, you know, it's, the walls are nicked up or anything like that. I, I'm just, I just go through it. I, for, I just verbalize everything. I don't. I asked because I had somebody yesterday say to me, what, what is the downside of me not being there for a walkthrough or out of state? Yeah. And I said, well, you know, if we have a good enough reception, it's out in the boondocks, we can, we can do it virtually. And you'll see everything. If we don't, I'll do the walkthrough to the best of my ability. Yeah. And relay that to you. And I just, yeah. I think the other thing that you could probably do is just ask, ask them if they have specific concerns. You know, is there, a, and you know, when you're finishing up this thing, is there anything else that you want to see a closer to any other point. concerns that yeah, you yeah. have? And just see, because a lot of times they'll be like, hey, you know, we saw this earlier. Is there, you know, can you go back and just take a quick look at that or what? And part of it is at this point, you should have a good sense of what the client's personality is like. And they also have a good sense of, okay, are they trusting the seller at this point? Are they trusting the agents? Um, how good does, you know, does the deal feel like I just closed on something for Union Beach this spring and we didn't go down for the walkthrough. I was like, do it, do it for us. Like, we, this mark is insane. I'm working like crazy. Like I can't leave right now. Um, and, but our seller was so amazing. Um, we bought it as is and she still replaced the HVAC for us. Well, right. Yeah. So even if there was a small problem, I didn't care at this point. Yeah. Like we completely yeah. trusted how she was going to yeah. leave, leave it. Right. Yeah. And we loved our agent and knew that um, she would probably pick up something. I wouldn't uh, kind of thing. So it is it, kind of a, I think, I think the CYA is always important to think through. And I think where you recap things in an email is, is always the smartest way to do it. But that's where when a, when a buyer asks a question like that, then you ask a question back. I don't like telling a buyer what to do. I like asking them questions to lead them to make their own decision. And I'll say, how trusting are you? Your eyes will pick up things that my eyes might, might not. I've got my checklist of obvious things I'm gonna look for. There may be things that you care about that I don't know about. How important is it for you to catch these things before you close? If it's important to you, you need to come down. If it's not important to you, then I'm gonna look for these three things. I'm gonna look for water, I'm gonna look for a tree, I'm gonna look for your appliances, <laughs> right? Uh, those are the three things I'm looking for. If that's satisfactory to you, then I can do the walkthrough and, and meet you at closing. Or if you have the mother-in-law or brother, sister, anyone in town, like send them over and they can do it with me. Uh, just stretch it. <laughs> um, yeah, all good questions. All right, six minutes left. Um, so we talked about final walkthrough, we talked about closing. Yay, you get Yay. the keys and the house Ooh. is yours that day. And then you get added to our um, our VIP client list. You get invited to um, parties and happy hours and all kinds of stuff going forward. And um, then I do even more special events for people who give us the most referrals. Referrals. Um, so if we've given you five star customer service throughout the entire process, um, we you know blah blah blah. Hopefully we are you become a raving fan and you turn around and tell all your friends and family about us. Blah blah blah. Yeah. Please feel um, free to use my name and your social media, you know, things like that. Kind of coach them through what you want them to do. Yeah. And if you do come across someone who wants to buy, who wants to sell, buy or invest in real estate, if you could call me and give me their name and number, that's usually the best way um, for us to make a connection. Um, oftentimes, the business card will just sit there because if they've got call reluctance. I'm going to buy a call and introduce myself and let them know that I'm a resource and they can tell that I am not high pressure. Uh, normally it's really helpful to them and it doesn't matter whether they're buying now or two years from now. Uh, I just always like to, you know, get myself to be a resource so they don't accidentally walk into an open house and get someone who's not experienced. That's a nice way to yeah. Um, yeah, so there's a number of times during the buyer consultation uh, where you're able to um, coach them on how to send referrals to you.
so I do quickly go over the buyer agency agreement. This is the document that we uh, that we both will be signing. This is what changes you from a customer to a client. Uh, so the, the seller has signed a listing agreement um, with a listing agent. That listing agent, their fiduciary duty is to that seller. There are things they're not allowed to tell you about. And anything you say to that agent, they're required to tell the seller. So nothing you say is secretive for, to them, right? Uh, so this is what gives you your own representation. And this outlines my fiduciary duties to you. And it also gives you some guidelines about what your duties would be, which is to work um, exclusively with Keller Williams during the term of this agreement. Uh, and then with the compensation set forth below, I think we work, might work this a little differently now. Um, what this big paragraph is saying down here is that you don't actually pay the compensation, uh, that you're giving me permission to be paid by the listing broker. The compensation has already been included um, in, in the list price and is notated in the MLS, the multiple listing service. Now, I have that, um, I think my value is a minimum two and a half percent. I put two and a half percent because that's what a lot of builders pay. Generally, I'm paid three percent. Uh, however, if anyone's offering less than that, then the one time money may come out of your pocket is if they're offering considerably less and we need to make up for my compensation. We'll be able to situate that with closing costs and we'll review that. That's something that we can talk about when it comes to a particular home. Are you comfortable with that? Um, um, I haven't, oh my, like Ryan being mm -hmm. two percent. Yeah. <gasps> so they just really dropped it. Um, and the one person we got under contract with Ryan Holmes has been such a pill. Like we don't even care. We don't even want a conversation with her. We're like, just don't talk to us for the next six months and we'll take anything um, to be done with you. Uh, so what happened, right, right, Shana? So you got to tell the story now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, it's just um, just high, <laughs> just high maintenance. Yeah. Just super, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just really, really high maintenance and not always logical. So well, it's nice. like we're not. It's not even worth me using all of my best scripts to make up. You know, it's, it's yeah. like not even worth it. Um, however, Ryan Holmes did just drop like this past year. They just dropped their compensation even more. It's like a flat, yeah, yeah. Fee flat fee based on the sale price. Oh. That's about forty-eight percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's not great. Um, so that's something where if you're showing Ryan Holmes, you want to let make sure the buyer knows. Hey, FYI, um, we'll see how much closing costs we can we can negotiate. Two percent of those closing costs are going to go towards my compensation. Because Ryan Holmes is not paying buyer's agents, right? So if you're looking at multiple builders, you just want to yeah. let them know we we need to make sure we're adding two percent to whatever cost Ryan Holmes is sharing because they're not paying full buyer agent compensation anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's possible. It's just like one more one more indication that Ryan Holmes is cutting corners. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, they'll quickly change it when it when it switches back to a balanced market and a buyer's market, but they yeah. know they can get away with it right now. Yeah. Um, now you may want to you may not want to throw that out too early if a buyer doesn't fully understand all these things yet. If they're only looking at um, new construction, you can only say these things when you've already proven your value and when they are hooked. You know, when they're hooked to your every word and they are now scared to try to do this on their own because they see that you know more than they do. Right. If you throw this out there too early, then they'll be like, well, why do I need a buyer agent when I'm doing new construction anyway? Um, I have a site agent. Right. And there's so much there is so much communication that can happen with the builders that you're that you aren't involved in. Um, but uh, so anyway, it, it is really important to, to build that value. Um, so the other thing with the duties be available during brokers regular working hours to view properties. Before this market, <laughs> before the last two years, I used to be in the, in the buyer's market and the balanced market. I was able to say, I don't make appointments on Sundays. Hmm. And I think, you know, early on, I had like 
Thursday day night, Thursday day night and appointments on Sunday. Otherwise I'm very flexible on those other days because I know that we've got to fit things around um, your work schedule. I worked with a lot of first time, buy first time home buyers who were not at a point in the career where they had as much flexibility in their work schedules, right? Or I have people on shift work and those types of things. So that was, my, I got the business plus 27. Um, it was, that was my decision to make myself a lot more available on the evenings and weekends because I knew every hour they didn't work was, was a loss of income, yes. right? Um, so it just, it depends on who you're working with and, um, and, you know, job schedules and, and those kinds of things you can be a lot more defined in, in your hours. And if it's important for you to be home when the kids are getting off the bus, then that's where you tell them, I do not make appointments between three o'clock and six o'clock. Uh, you know, so whatever fits, so it's God family first, right? You need to define how that is in your schedule and then and then you allow your business to be outside that. So this is where you can have that conversation. What's up, Jim? I was just gonna add to what you're saying and if that was a lesson that I learned pretty early on when we got super, super, super busy. Mm -hmm. It was not just important to protect my time, it was important to explain that for, for other reasons as well. So they knew that, for example, if I said, look from this hour to this hour, I'm gonna be running kids around and making dinner and things like that. If you need me, if it's not an emergency, email me so I don't miss a text. If it's an emergency, call me. But that way, I set them up in advance so that they knew that I wasn't just ignoring them. Right. Yeah. They knew that I was. I was. I didn't want to miss their their communication. Yeah. But this is the best way to communicate with me from this time to this time. Because otherwise, I don't. I don't want to miss it. I want to make sure that I'm taking care of you. Yeah. But this is how you need to be because what the, what was happening was we were having so much business that it was we were. I was overwhelmed with that with that with those communication and I and I. Really hard, and I was trying to, trying not to be Yeah, yeah. That's also, also a good way to set that. It's so, yeah, it's so important to train people how they communicate to you. And then there's also, if you're super responsive to them during the day, and then all of a sudden you're not, like yeah. fires start spinning in their heads, right? And so that's where you tell them, hey, between five and eight, I'm not going to be as quick to respond. However, I do get back into my email and check my and check all my messages. Um, I will, I will pop back in between eight and ten. So I may be physically showing you homes at five or six of those days that we've scheduled that, but those days we're not physically looking at homes, I'm gonna be slower during this time block um, because this is when I'm with my family, right? And um, so anyway, so yeah, so those are really good expectations of that. And that can kind of naturally come up while you're going through this agreement. Um, and, and this is where I wish I had been so much more clear on those yellow flags um, early in my career, because there are several clients I should have fired, I should not have taken on. Mm -hmm. So when I said I don't take appointments on Sundays and and Thursday night, day night, uh, and then the first question back was, well, what if Sunday's my only day available? Like, no <coughs> five. They immediately are testing my boundaries, right? And that person ended up being a nightmare. So I didn't know until I went through that experience. Like, oh my God, <laughs> on the first day, they were telling me they were going to be a pain, yeah. right? And she, the reason she had to go look at property on Sunday is because she was drinking on Saturday, <laughs> right? It's not because she had like a wedding to go to. No, she had a friend coming in town and they were, you know, bar hopping or whatever. So it's like, she was not making home searching a priority. And and expected me to not put God and family first, yeah. to put her first. And if I had stuck to my boundaries, I wouldn't know from day one that I shouldn't be working with this person. Because yeah. that came up over and over and over again. Um, so pay attention to how people react when you do when you do mm -hmm. these things. So like and it's not to say I don't work on Sunday. I would still be writing offers and negotiating those kinds of things, but I was trying to create some space where I wasn't automatically filling up every single day with appointments, because if you don't do that, it, um, what's the bold thing? Time expands to, um, the work will fill the time that you allot, that yeah. you allot for it. Time yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that um uh I've, I've been doing some good heavy uh therapy this summer uh there's there's two reasons with the anchor one is yeah you need to go back and and consider how you set the boundaries and two think about 
if you're feeling angry, you need to think what the other emotion is behind that. Are you feeling resentful? Are you feeling envious? Can someone else has more time about? Whatever that emotion is, you then go back to your childhood <laughs> and you figure out all the times you felt that emotion because you're reacting to your client right now from something that actually happened a long time ago. If, if, if you should be at a level three and you're on a level seven or eight, that's when you need to check yourself. Yeah. 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 Right. Mm -hmm. But if when you find that you're overreacting, like any kind of emotions are, are totally fine. Uh, but angry is usually anger is usually an overreaction, right? And so there's two things. One is do you need to reset the boundaries? Are they really just disrespecting it? But if you're overreacting, it's like what else is that reminding you of? Because uh, that might help bring you and bring you a couple notches down when you're talking to that client again, when you realize it actually has to do with your stuff. Um, and you have control of that. <laughs> <laughs> good, good parenting advice. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And overreacting to your kids. Yeah. Um, okay. So, any, oh, the recording of the property. I love pointing this out ahead of time as buyer's agents. So, there's so many more gadgets these days. And this paragraph got added a couple years ago. It yeah. didn't exist when I first got into business. Um, those ring doorbells, they can hear you to the street. So if you're chit-chatting by your car, they can still hear you. They can hear you while you're sitting on the front porch. So if your clients are like super sassy, like, ew, I can't believe I picked up color and <laughs> start making comments, that wife is yes. listening and she is not. Yes. And they're not going to like your offer. Yeah. Yeah. So if you end up writing an offer, uh, then they've already been like, now I don't like these people. Uh, like you definitely got to be the best to win because now they have an emotional reason to say no to you, right? So you want to coach your buyers ahead of time to be polite. Don't make fun of the 1980s wedding photo that's in the hall. And because oh. there's all those gadgets yeah. in the hall that they can listen. If um, if there's any echo, uh, any any kind of smart stuff, a lap, you know, any kind of computer sitting around, um, nanny cams, there's so many ways they could be watching us and listening to us. So that, so we want, we, we don't want to offend. Um, what we do want to do is still walk through, talk out loud about what we like and don't like, um, talk about pros and cons, talk about our checklist. We're going to go through, okay, here are all the things, here are all your must-haves. We're going to go through and make sure that the home has your must-haves. Um, and then when we get to the point, and, and then we have a ranking thing that we do, um, we get to the point where it's clear that, oh, this, this might be one we're writing an offer on. That's when the conversation stops. So we're not going to change too much about what we do. We just want to be aware and not be offensive. Um, but when it comes to before, back in the day, I'd be like, sweet, let's talk terms. I'm going to write everything down while we're still here in this house. Then I'm going to drive, I'm going to drive straight home, write up this offer and email it to you, right? Um, but now it's like, time out. We got to go. We got to get away from this house in our cars, drive away, and then go on the phone yeah. and talk about all our terms. Mm -hmm. uh, so that <laughs> I think is a really important thing for you to be aware of and coach your buyers through it. Yeah. Um, so those are a couple of quick things I'll point out. I don't like over emphasize or read through this verbatim or make too big of a deal about it. And I just kind of, it's like a something close, right? I'll be sending this um, to you after this meeting so that at this point, if you're comfortable hiring me and my team um, to be your buyer's agent, uh, then this is what creates all those next other next steps to happen. Uh, any questions about this? And then if someone has an objection, we'll get to talk through it or an additional question. Nine times out of 10, no question. Uh, I'm sending them all the disclosures up front. And again, I'll just quickly, so there's two disclosures. It'll, I'll send this over at the same time as the buyer's agency agreement to have you sign it now. What these disclosures are saying is you don't have to use these companies, but they have an affiliation with Tyler Williams, so I have to disclose that to you. You're signing it. There's no agreement whatsoever. It's just easy paperwork to take care of ahead of time. Any questions about these? There's never any questions. And then boom, great. Is there anything I didn't cover today that you wish we had talked about? And that's how you, know, you get to wrapping up the meeting. Sometimes there's a new question. Other times you're like, oh my gosh, you went over way more than I expected. This was amazing. Um, I feel so much better now, yada, yada, yada. Um, and then you always want to talk about what the next step is. Every time you talk to a client, you want to handle whatever it is that they talk about and then, and then set the expectation for what's next, right? So that would be, um, so depending on where they are in the process, I'll let them know, okay, next step is, um, you know, whatever. What, so I use this buyer console as a way to close on buyers who were relocating, who were talking to three different agents. 
So I scheduled a battle consult with them, the virtual consult, uh, like that week and kind of flipped the order. And then once they went through this with me, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, totally want to hire you and your yeah. company, right? <laughs> and so like, great, the next step is Shane is going to reach out to you to go a little deeper in the needs analysis. She has all my notes from our first call. So I set them up, you know, I'd already talked about the team. We, and we, in our book, we've got a page with everyone's pictures and whatever else. So I get to sell them on, on the idea of a team. Um, I don't know why, but I've been totally focused on you. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're always on me. Yeah. 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 You know, they, they've already been introduced to that I, that idea, so then I'm letting you know what the next step is. And of course, Shane is perfectly um, capable of doing these viral consults too. So, oh, FYI, I am now at the point where I have, um, Shane and I partnered up, so she's focused on buyers and I'm focused on sellers. But at the same time, we still come in for my sphere. So I kind of play with everyone, like on a case-by-case -case basis, where are they in the process? I'm also like, if someone's calling me and says they're interested in something, I'm I'm going to do that initial conversation and um, and see where you know how like where they are in the process. Help them get started and make sure they're super serious before I hand them over to Shana because I don't expect Shana to be doing continued lead gen in my sphere, right? So I'm going to get them to a certain point so that I'm handing someone over to Shana on a golden platter. Um, like I already started the pre-approval process. They've already um, they've already done follow up from things that we've asked them to do. Because how many people say, oh my God, I really want to buy a house. And then you don't hear from them for two years, mm -hmm. right? Like a lot of people say things and then the action can take a lot longer. So it's my job to be through that. Um, so I can I can hand someone over earlier and have Shana do the bar consult. Uh, so we just, you know, we work on that in tandem. So for some of you maybe on teams, that's where uh, it just depends on, yeah, who's doing what, how much responsibility it is. All right, so any questions from you guys? Anything I didn't cover that you wish I did? I know we're over. It's 1.13 for anyone who has something they need to get to. I had a question in the chat. Yeah. Hi, Catherine. This is Burnett. Good to see you. Hey, good to see you. Thanks for joining. I had a quick question going back to the inspections. Yeah. Do, you, do you usually just rely on, say you've got repairs, they've been done, do you rely on those receipts coming over, over as validation that those repairs were completed? Oh, no. And I might have skipped over that. That was in the, um, I probably did, in the whole timeline thing, in the buyer booklet. Yeah. Uh, that may or may not be spelled out as well. But so thank you. That's such a good question. Um, we haven't been doing it as much as past year because we've been waiting so much. Um, however, previously, uh, if we've asked for major repairs done in the inspection, um, our addendum will say, uh, we want receipts either five or 10 days prior to closing, depending on how long the closing is. So we're very specific and we say, we want receipts X days prior to closing. So we're giving the seller a deadline. We don't want to be handed stuff an hour before closing and then us trying to figure out if it's actually done or not, right? And the home inspector wants to be able to review those receipts and see what the contractor actually did. We also want to confirm that it was a contractor if it was required to be. So when it comes to plumbing, electrical, certain things like that, we make really specific. If it's a normal handyman kind of job, then we're not going to say it has to be a licensed contractor. Um, so that is where um, our addendum will say receipts have to be turned into us prior. And then uh, that creates a window where we can come back in to reinspect. Um, so there's also an expectation to set with your buyer that that reinspection usually costs somewhere between $150 to $200. Um, and so if you've asked for big ticket items, you absolutely want that reinspected. If it's smaller, one thing, if, if the item costs $200 to repair, then you're not going to pay $200 to inspect it, right? Uh, but you might want to call the contractor, um, mention the house, and make sure the contractor can actually remember being there. Um, and I've had fictitious, uh, I've had fictitious receipts before. So you want to double check um, some of the things, make sure that they've actually been there and done the repair, you know, that it says. Um, 
And so we're always giving the buyer that option to reinspect, and that is something I want in writing if they choose not to reinspect. Uh, so nine times out of ten, if, if a lot of uh, negotiations were happening, I want that home inspector back in. I never rely on receipts alone, and um, ninety-five percent of the time, it has not been a clean reinspection. There is always something not fully done or not quite done to trade standards. Um, like they smear tar on it instead of replacing it, you know, like that stupid stuff like that. Um, so I highly, highly, highly recommend your inspection by never relying on the seats alone. Uh, but it's always up to the buyer. So it kind of depends on what the reference is. So that, that's a conversation. Um, so if the receipts are due five days or 10 days prior, we might tentatively schedule that reinspection for four days prior. So we have time to collect the receipts, we get everything gathered, we send it over or have it printed for the home inspector. We do the reinspection. If there's a problem, we still have a couple days to try to get things fixed before closing. So you need to send the contractors back out. You might send the reinspector back out. Sorry, the inspector back out. To inspect. um, again, we can send that inspector out as many times as possible until everything is clear. Uh, and we can hold up closing until it is. And that's up to the buyer, of course, right? At a certain point, if it's a small enough item and you're up against a rate cap, a rate block, mm -hmm. then the buyer may be like, let's just close, I'll do it later. Um, but a seller may promise you something's going to get done after closing and there's no way to hold them accountable. So you have to have that conversation with the buyer ahead of time. Um, and, then, uh, and then you still want to do the walkthrough. That is separate from the reinspection. So if you've done the reinspection four or five days ahead, you still want that final walkthrough the night before or day off because you're looking for different things. Yep. Great, thank you. Very helpful. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? So as a sole agent, not capital. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so at this point, my presentation pretty much was the intake was the first thing the Jack Mason sent me the Zoom link. We do everything from meet endless to agency process. Yeah. I'm seeing now the logic of breaking those two things up. So when it comes to the needs analysis, is that something that you do via Zoom or is it like a, a phone call and you guys are not, not that way at the same time as the intake? Yeah, I do. I do. The needs analysis I do, um, I just do as a phone call uh, because I'm taking notes the whole time. Yeah. So I uh, I don't have a good double screen set up. Um, I don't have all the fancy equipment, so I can't see the people, uh, you know, kind of things. So I just that I just prefer to do as, as a call, and that you can kind of do. So I have I have my intake form. Um, it's two pages. It's it's really ugly because it's like twelve years old at this point, but it's like you know, this old Excel spreadsheet thing. And so I know where everything is in that form. So in that conversation, I can flip around and put the information in the right boxes so that when I'm looking for something later or if I'm handing it off to a buyer's agent, uh, there, there's a system to where information goes so everyone knows where to look to get it. Um, so on the first page, it's like the top of it is all the contact information, right? It's the reminder of like, okay, I have their email, but I don't have their mailing address yet. Uh, and then it's, it's the timing, motivation, um, expectations of me as their buyer's agent. So this is where you get to have they had bad experiences with previous agents. I want to know what was bad, right? Is it just because they're always going to blame the other person? Well, yellow flag. Um, or is there something where, okay, this is an expectations, um, you know, dialogue or whatever else that are there objections to handle up front, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then I've got um, financial. So at some point in the conversation, a lot of times you got to warm them up before you go into that. Uh, and then, and then there's, oh, so anyway, I'll be teaching a class on that. Yeah. I just went into too much detail. Um, so that'll be another probably 90 minute class, even though it could be a 20 minute conversation, it'll be a 45 minute conversation, but what I'll do is I'll break it down. I'll talk about scripting. I'll talk about the whys behind everything. Um, and so that's why. The conversation with the client, me teaching this class is always going to be longer yeah. than talking to the client because we're teaching, um, we're talking about the why behind each one of these steps. Um, so that, so this consult, if the client's not interrupting me with questions, it's 60 minutes. Every, everything that, all of those documents, I can review that in an hour. Um, if it's experience is super rapid, then I might be able to do it in 40 minutes. 
but I'm kind of verbose, so I might take longer than another person. Wilson's laughing. And I sometimes say things, you know, in three different ways. Um, but yeah, why was I going into detail with the new stuff? Well, actually, I thought about the order, like the oh, phone yeah. call and all that. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I do it in the phone calls. I have that form. And so that's where, if your initial call is like five minutes and they have to go, I'm getting as much contact information as possible. Right? So anytime I'm having another conversation with them, I can keep going back and adding it to the same form um, versus having notes in. in you know, multiple areas. So that way it's all going back in one place. So that that form may get filled out in, in over three, four, five conversations. It may happen in one. Uh, so I'll keep the person on the phone as long as they're willing to talk to me. Okay. And I'll just keep going to the next thing, keep, keep going to the next thing, keep digging. You know, it's a conversation. So sometimes sometimes they'll just start giving all this information about the house. Well, it's not in my order, but I flip to page two and I start writing all the notes. And then when they take a pause, I can get control of the conversation again, go back to a question and start getting the information I need sooner, um, you know, than later. Cool. Yeah. Thanks everyone at home for joining us. Uh, are you going to smell the Yeah. Well, and I'll keep talking. If you guys have questions, I'll keep talking. Can you send out these the packets so the information we can find it? And you get. Um, so this this packet is a case of Richmond thing, so I cannot send that to you. Oh, yeah. um, all of the other documents are in RAR uh, Instanet. So what I did, um, uh, you were here in the beginning, I'll go back to this page. So this is what I did. So you'll need to go download it yourself from Instanet. And that's where I went and plugged in a couple things as reminders for me to talk about it. And it's also kind of good like for that to get exposed to the buyer ahead of time. Like, here's what the actual, so instead of me just verbally explaining the clause about inspection and appraisal, I'm giving them the clauses up front so they can get really familiar with it. Um, so I just did a sample contract uh, in Instanet. Then I downloaded it. I created this file called um, Buyer Consult Docs. So when I schedule my buyer consult appointment, I'm sending them the email. I'm confirming that we'll be talking tomorrow at 10 a.m. And here, you know, here's the, the Google chat link, whatever. Um, and I then only have to open one file, attach all these documents, and, and send that over. So it's, it's um, organized for me to send the email, and it's organized for me for the appointment. So I'm going in, open, 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 open. And five or 10 minutes before the appointment, I got myself prepared. So you, um, everything is included on the internet, RAR, except for the buyer book. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so that's where um, you'll want to, so, and, and for any new agents, if you don't have, um, if you get an appointment tomorrow and you don't have a buyer booklet prepared yet, that's where you check out the, the RAR sources, the CAR and Keller Williams, find any contract to close checklist, and that can be your buyer booklet. It can just be one page. It, you don't have to have the marketing around it. You don't thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, you don't have to have a fancy name yet. You don't have to have an LLC. You don't have to have all those things. Just have one page with that process on it so that you can talk about it in your healthy set expectations. You can start down and dirty. Not everything has to look pretty. You know more than that buyer does, and they don't know any better, right? They don't know that you don't have a package. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Thank you so much. Nice. You're welcome. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And what was your name? Sorry, I took you back. Ayana. Ayana. Ayana? Mm -hmm. Ayana. 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 Mm -hmm. Yes. Cool. And then Jason is extra. Um, I should have said this in the beginning of the class. I am terrible with names. Um, <laughs> like it's a, it's a glitch in my brain. Like I could be sitting in the office with a Shana and go blank on her name, right? Um, so Shana. I'm Shana. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we work together. Um, so if I walk by you in the hallway and I can't remember your name, please never be offended. If you reintroduce yourself to me every time you see me in the office, that's great. Um, it is horrible being in sales because I will run into my clients in like the grocery store or a festival. Um, it, it, it is me. It's not you. I don't want anyone ever to think that, you know, they're not important. I can't remember. No, I, it's just, it's a terrible glitch in my brain. I am horrible at remembering names. 
So um, yeah, don't ever feel like not seen. Um, so I'll have to ask over and over again. Um, all right, all questions answered. All right, thank you folks at home. One more thing, Shit. I'm sorry. Shana? No, Shana. That's Catherine. Catherine. I'm Catherine. I'm Shana. I'm Shana. <laughs> Do you send your resources before or after they sign with you? The 